Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I am sorry that I am just recording this at 12 o'clock um, in the daytime, way past when I usually would do a video, and the reason is because people are, are so excited about what's going on in digital assets right, right now that I have been getting phone calls off the hook wanting to talk about all of this. Sometime, and that includes the official father of the Digital Asset Investor channel, um, it includes several people the, you may know who he is, the official smart aleck of the Digital Asset Investor channel. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give uh, the uh, shout out to the official smart Alex uh, brother, who's the official older brother of the Digital Asset Investor channel. Um, but first, so I've been talking to all of these people and and um, about different things going on and, and how wild er everything is going on right now. But. So yesterday I showed you a, a seven minute clip from what fascinated me. This this um, it was a Harvard digital currency, like a crisis management where they pretended to be in the White House. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but that seven minute clip was just a small clip from what actually was an hour and a half uh, session that they did. And so I went back and listened to a part of the hour and a half session. And I found another large clip that I thought was just fascinating. Now, remember, as I when I play this, you need to remember this clip um, is about six or so minutes long. And in 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 this, but but the scenario that they are painting here is they're they're saying, okay, it's uh, they're 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 doing this in 2019, that, but they're pretending. I think that that, that it's 2020, that it's the year 2020 and um, or 2021 and China has launched their own digital currency from March 20th of 2020, um, the digital yuan. And it's like a crisis scenario. They're trying to figure out what to do. Listen up. They have that visibility. But now it's a third party, a country, North Korea, using that along with a new system called a cross-border payment system, right. a CIPS which is competing with SWIFT. So they have a new messaging system mm -hmm. that they stood up in 2016, as you recall. Yes. And that new messaging system, I don't think it will undermine the role of the US dollar in international commerce, but it absolutely puts to bed that SWIFT cannot be used as an right. instrument of So this is policy. a really important fact, excuse me, Madam Vice President, that we're going to examine a little bit later on. But with that, Madam Vice President, go yes, ahead. Yes, thank you for yielding the floor. Of course, Madam. Um, <laughs> I'd like to know about the CIPICS, this basically, am I correct in understanding that it is the Chinese equivalent to SWIFT? They, they in and, fact, they, in fact uh, they, they actually took the software from SWIFT with a memorandum of understanding. They, they took that software and created their own messaging system. And are there other countries that are using it or might potentially use it? And is there a tipping point at which point the global economy will be, in fact, bifurcated? Again, I think it, we're decades away from China developing the robust capital markets and the legal systems to compete with the U.S. dollar. But to your question, yes, other countries have adopted the CIPS. Russia has back in 2019. They entered into a bunch of agreements. Um, and so they're moving uh, value, money, outside of the SWIFT system. And more and more, all respect to the State Department, we won't be able to use SWIFT uh, as we, we've sort of weaponized SWIFT, but we won't be able to use it that much longer. As always, Madam Vice President, excellent question. And we're going to continue running a good process, just like a good Deputy National Security Advisor in the Bush administration would. Um, <laughs> for the Director of National Intelligence now, the question is, does the U.S. ability to enforce sanctions on North Korea become impacted when we know the North Koreans are moving towards a digital yuan, they're using that, maybe moving, moving off SWIFT. What's your bottom line assessment from the DNI on the enforceability and usefulness leverage of sanctions? 
Well, I think it's challenging, um, but not impossible. Um, and when I think about sanctions enforcement, I think about it at a tactical level and a strategic level. And I think at the tactical level, it really depends on what information we have. And we've had some success um, going after um, digital currency efforts by other countries like Iran by gathering enough information about digital IP addresses related to the currencies. Whether we can do that here, I can't make any promises. We've been obviously hard at work trying to gather any information we have that we could be you know, putting to use in that kind of a strategy, and it's, it's very challenging. But at a strategic level, I wanted to, to kind of go back to Secretary Summers' remarks, and I completely agree that, that really the cooperation with China is the key here. But what we've talked about so far, I think, is the Chinese government, and there's another actor involved here, which, which are the Chinese commercial banks. That, as I understand it, the way the digital currency is structured, Chinese commercial banks are in the middle of it, and they have an interest in doing business in the United States. And so at some point, we need to think about what kind of pressure and other tools can we use um, to focus on those banks and their interests in the United States. And that's where we have to decide what appetite do we have, how much pressure do we want to put on them, and um, how would we approach it. But I think a strategy could be developed around those particular banks. Wait, 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 wait. just, just one President, thing here. I'm sorry. Madam Go Vice ahead. President. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, do those banks, Chinese banks, have any ability to make independent decisions if the Chinese government is telling them that they need to distribute this digital yuan? I mean, is pressure on those individual banks of any value? Well, I think they'll have to make a decision about whether they want to give up completely business in the United States. And they may, make, may choose or may be forced to make that choice, but it's not what we've seen them do in the past. Okay. The, again, I, I excellent point. Of, we want to keep in mind points of leverage we have in order to coerce or achieve our interests. So we're going to mark that down. Secretary Summers, please. I think we've got to get a couple things straight. First, as the President pointed out in her campaign, the degree of separation between U.S. banks and the U.S. government is less than immense with the tendency for the U.S. government historically to follow the instincts of U.S. banks. So are you and saying U.S. banks are analogous to Chinese no, banks? No, I'm not. I'm saying that in government? China, the banks and the government are one, and the banks will do what the government wants it to, and the Vice President is entirely right, and we can think of ourselves as dealing with one decision maker, which is the Chinese government. That's, point. That's uh, the first uh, point. The second point is, Respectfully, I don't think it matters one whit just what the Chinese government can see of any kind of yuan system. Anything that's got to do with the yuan, the Chinese government are going to see plenty easily. The threat, I mean, the challenge here is that we have had what, if you step back from the point of view of the rest of the world, is a kind of remarkable power which is that if somebody in Vietnam wants to pay somebody in Laos, and we're no, no one American is within 10,000 miles of the thing, we've somehow had an ability to get involved and disrupt that. And we are in danger yes. of losing that. Yes. By the way... That's what I wanted you to hear. He, he, he's basically saying we're in danger of losing the world reserve currency status. Now, I, I went just... For the fun of it, I went into this and I went right here and looked. I went name by name to see if any of, if I recognized any of these names or if they had anything to do with Ripple. There were two of them that I did find, and I found this interesting. This guy right here is a guy that that um, I remembered. His, uh, I saw his name, at least. It's uh, Gary Gensler, and I saw his name, and it reminded me. I, I said, I know that name from somewhere. And so I did a search on him, and what do you know? He pops up. He is the guy, and I remember this like it was yesterday. It was from 2018. For those of you that weren't here, in 2018, if you owned XRP or any other digital asset, it felt like we were getting kicked while we were down at every turn. And this was one of those, and a lot of it came from Bloomberg. Former CFTC head says big cryptocurrencies could be classified as securities. And I remember it like it was yesterday, and it was this Gensler guy, the same guy that's right here. He came out out of nowhere. At the time, the security thing was not really out there even as an art. It had not even been brought up. This guy comes up to the microphone out of nowhere and throws out 
that he thinks XRP and Ethereum could be securities, but not Bitcoin. He did, he's the one that said it. Well, so I did a search for the other people in that video, and another one came up, and this is her. This is another one of the people at that table, and she retweeted the art, another article about Gary Gensler, where he's saying that, that XRP and, and Ethereum, that Ripple and how there's a strong case for Ethereum and Ripple are securities. So both she and him are sitting at this table at Harvard, and both of them are trying to put a damper on XRP and Ethereum. That's that's all that I found in terms of ties. But there was one other thing that this Harvard roundtable reminded me of, and that was a little paper. This was a little paper from April 2019. Ripple, the business of crypto. The case, this is like something that students at Harvard actually have to buy for, their, for a course, I guess. The case explores Ripple CEO Brad Gringhouse's mission to disrupt the global payments industry by leverage, leveraging the, the cryptocurrency XRP. Students will learn about Bitcoin and the blockchain industry as well as Ripple's unique crypto business model. The case provides an opportunity to navigate the areas of distributed ledger technology, platforms, regulation, and global payments from the perspective of a San Francisco software startup with over 20 billion in digital assets. All right, so next, um, the other thing that that video reminded me of is that Ripple was looking for some, they're talking about um, the digital yuan in relation to how that would affect economic sanctions on North Korea. And it reminded me of this position that Ripple was looking for recently. Okay, so now I'm gonna leave all that behind and I'm gonna take you down another road of what's going on, all right? Remember we were talking about the IMF special drawing, right? The SDR, and here's the basket of the SDR as it is. So remember, as of 2015, I believe they added the Chinese yuan to the basket. And I've floated the idea that I believe they will have many currencies in this basket and all of them over time will be digital. And I believe XRP might be one of them. OK, so yesterday we started seeing different things. This is Signal Bank has launched a digital ver version of the Swiss franc to allow faster payments when trading a new breed of digital assets. So they, they have now tokenized the Swiss franc. And I read this article and it said that the bank would have to have one Swiss franc in the bank for each Swiss franc. So it's actually tied to the Swiss franc. And then there was this from just, what, two days ago. China launches national blockchain network in 100 cities by April 2020. This will also be the start of the digital yuan. Do I need to answer any questions there? I don't think I do. Um, and then there was this from Mike Preston yesterday. This one hit the digital asset space by storm last, yesterday evening. I was getting phone calls from yesterday evening all the way to today on this. House Democrats consider digital wallets for crisis payments. This came to us out of nowhere, folks. The, in the bill that they are trying to pass right now they have and i'm going to go through it here watch this from jim hyatt um this is part of the bill in general not later than january 14th 2021 all federal reserve banks shall make 15 digital dollar wallets available to all citizens and 16 legal permanent residents of the united states 17 and business entities for which the principal um, and there's several things here. Cryptopolis had retweeted his tweet and says the financial reset has begun. Digital dollar wallets available to all citizens and legal permanent residents of the United States. Can you hear me, folks? All right. And then from Cryptopolis, when the bill passes, every U.S. bank account will have a pass through digital asset wallet. And if you don't have one, you can use digital wallet ATMs at the USPS branches, mainstream and mass adoption in one move. And re listen to this folks, pass through digital dollar wallet. The, the term pass through digital dollar wallet means a digital wallet 
or account maintained by a member bank on behalf of a qualified individual where such qualified individual is entitled to a pro rata share of pooled reserve balance that the member bank maintains at the Federal Reserve Bank. The term qualified individual means any individual other than any non-resident alien individual. In geographic areas where physical access to a branch of the Federal Reserve Bank is limited, Federal Reserve Banks serving such areas shall partner with the United States Postal Service branch offices to ensure access and availability to application and account services for digital dollar wallets. In conjunction with the United States Postal Service, access to automated teller machines to be maintained on behalf of the Board of the United States Postal Service at branch offices. Folks, it's right in your face now if you want to see it, okay? We've been talking about this for almost two years. It is right in front of your face. So pay attention. So then from Mr. XRP, he sends me this article from Forbes. New, the word I can't say, stimulus bill in Congress creates U.S. digital dollar. I will read from here. The bill establishes a digital dollar, which it defines as a balance expressed as a dollar value consisting of digital dollar entries that are recorded as liabilities in the accounts of any Federal Reserve Bank or an electronic unit of value redeemable by any eligible financial institution as determined by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Additionally, a digital dollar wallet as identified as a digital wallet or account maintained by the Federal Reserve Bank on, on behalf of any person that represents holdings in an electronic device or service that is used to store digital dollars that may be tied to a digital or physical identity. Um, Amanda, the, a mandate also requires all member banks to establish a pass-through di digital dollar wallet to all customers eligible for stimulus. Member banks, in other words, folks, well, I'm going to read this last part. Member banks include those bank in, include those banks that are members of the Federal Reserve and regulated by the Fed. Additionally, non-member state banks, those that that not members of the Federal Reserve and regulated by the FDIC, could opt into the offer passed through digital wallets as well. Every bank, folks, all the money, all the banks. Every bank would have a digital wallet. Now, do you understand what this means, folks? Because I'm going to, I'm about to spell it out. Before I finish spelling it out, I'm going to show you this clip from Brad Garlinghouse. Um, this is from Spiro. Central banks will need a system to exchange their CBDCs. Ripple has built a global infrastructure utilizing XRP. Many central banks have already partnered with Ripple. Listen up. I'll also start by kind of explaining the basics of what Ripple is. Let me and refresh what that. Not. That's not moving. Let me refresh that. Start by kind of explaining the basics of what Ripple is and what Ripple is not. Uh, Ripple is a private company. We're based in California, uh, about three or 400 employees around the world. And we're trying to solve a problem. We're selling technologies to banks and financial institutions to solve a cross-border payments problem. To be clear, we have not focused on the central bank digital currency issuance. Uh, our view is very much there needs to be interoperability globally. And even in a world of CBDCs, you still need interoperability to, to solve that problem. Uh, also, before I dive in, you know, my comments are more focused on kind of explaining how Ripple's approaching this, this problem as opposed to just CBDCs. But I thought it worth spending a moment on how we think about blockchain at large and why it is such an interesting technology and I think appropriate for central banks and commercial banks to be looking at. For me, the novelty of any blockchain technology is the ability for two parties to transact without trust, but with certainty. So today, anytime we transact, we are transacting through a central counterparty, whether that be a correspondent bank where Ripple is focused or that be a Visa or American Express, what have you. The opportunity around blockchains is to change that dynamic. And I think many industries, whether it's payments, what we're talking about today, or securities, or even loans, any of those transactions, I think, can be uh, disrupted and made more efficient through blockchain technologies. All right, so with that kind of brief introduction, you know, I'll be brief on some of my comments here because uh, we've, we've touched on this already. You know, global, I think we would largely have few uh, arguments the idea that global payments today have not caught up with the age of the internet. 
uh, you know, we talk about slow, we've talked about the, the 14 days that Norman mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the, the younger generations today are accustomed to be able to open up their smartphone and click on a button and have an ice cream delivered in 20 minutes. They aren't going to be very happy when it takes their payments, you know, days and lots of costs uh, uh, to get to them. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you, but here's, I want to drive this point home. What they what they're saying in this bill, folks, is that there you will have a digital wallet at every bank that's in a Federal Reserve Bank, which is pretty much all the major banks. Right. So what is about to happen to put this in perspective? Just forget about XRP for a minute. Imagine. And I guess I need to in order to really do this, we need to have coin market cap pulled up. OK. This is your market, $182 million. This stimulus bill is somewhere between a trillion and five trillion dollars, folks. And what they're telling you in this bill is that all of these banks will have to create digital wallets. And when you create digital wallets, that is what that is doing is that is bringing right now, right now, let's look. This is from a, this is, this is an article from a, um, a study. That in 2019, there are roughly 36.5 million Americans that own some form of crypto. The population of the United States is roughly $327 million. Now, this bill is a United States bill. Right now, we're only talking about the United States. But if you think that only the United States is about to do this for their stimulus, then you need to think again. This is not, remember when Anna Boten in that video I showed you a week ago, remember when she said, you don't understand there's going to be, I think she said there's going to be 1.8 billion digital wallets. Remember when she said that? It was either 1.8 or 2.8 billion digital wallets. She spoke the day before Brad Garlinghouse spoke at the Economic Club of New York and said that. This is not just the United States doing this. Mark my words, it's going to be the whole world. But just look at the United States. Instead of 336.5 million Amer Americans owning crypto, all of a sudden, you're going to have almost all the Americans that are in the crypto world because a digital wallet brings them into the crypto world. Make no mistake. Remember, Brad Garlinghouse said that banks will be storing digital assets. It's not just going to be the U.S. dollar either. All right, or the U.S. dollar digital asset. Um, so you're talking about, we're talking about bringing, adding one to five trillion to this space. Right now it's at 182 billion. And an additional almost 300 million people. That's just the United States. That assumes that no other countries add something like this in their bills. But I wasn't born yesterday and you better believe they will. Now, I thought it'd be interesting to let, let's take a look who are the digital wallet providers that we are aware of? Just by pure coincidence, when this bill came out yesterday, our old friend Vitse Venn, who is funded by Ripple, just happened to announce that he will be doing a Periscope on Twitter today, all right, because he tweeted this yesterday, um, at 1500 Amsterdam time for some launch. That's the, mo that's the mobile bank. The, he, he's called it the bank on your phone. That's the mobile app that he's been working on. The Sum app will launch. I'll share what Sum is and what it isn't and explain what our next steps are. After sharing my hopes for the future of Sum ecosystem, I'll take some questions. All right. So he put, he just happens to put that out yesterday after that, after we saw the draft of the, the bill by the Democrats. So let's go through what some other wallets that I think uh, are important or wallets and other things that are important to be thinking about as we go into this world of d banks having their di a digital asset wallet for all people that have bank accounts. The next thing that came to my mind was, remember about a month or two ago, and I was actually talking to Mr. B about this. He said to me, he said, why is Ripple all of a sudden talking about this bread wallet? They talked about it in at least one or two videos. And then they retweeted, they actually retweeted this tweet right here because you can see it right there. The bread wallet. All of a sudden they were talking about this bread wallet and how secure it was and all of this. But I mean, there's a lot of wallets. Well, when I saw this, I knew my, my antenna went up and I immediately thought, okay, let me just, let me just throw this out there. 
I believe this bread wallet is somewhere in the equation. I believe that they are, uh, when you use this wallet somehow, some way, um, your assets will instantly be secured probably through on the back end, something like PolySign. That's what I'm thinking. Um, I mean, PolySign. All right. Now let's talk about some other wallets that could be. And when I say that these wallets could be in the mix, what I mean is that some of these banks, the banks aren't going to create their own apps. Some of these banks could be running on the apps that I'm showing you here is what my point is. With, of course, PolySign running on the back end. Um, so we've also another player in the game that I think will be somewhere, and this is Bact. Remember, Bact said they were going to launch their app this year. The Bact app aggregates cash, crypto, rewards, and game points and will enable consumers to make purchases or transfer money to another person using a variety of digital assets. And then what else do we have? We have Coinbase. I believe Coinbase is certainly a player somewhere in all of this. Um, starting today, eligible US, so Coinbase has had a USD coin. Now, I'm not saying that's the same thing as what the United States is putting out. Who knows how all this is going to come out? But I believe they're going to be in the game. Circle's going to be in the game. They've got the USD coin, the stability of the dollar at the speed of crypto. Okay, they're going to be somewhere in the game. And I, when I was looking this up, I saw this video from their CEO, Jeremy Allaire. Watch this. Market infrastructure like Visa, that emerged. Well, let me um, refresh that. As a non Let's refresh that so we can get some video here. Sure, like Visa, that emerged um, as a nonprofit association um, of commercial financial institutions who said, we need to have interoperability. Like if we all have different cards with different schemes like then no one can pay anybody and we don't get network effects and so why would we want to do that so they said okay let's let's agree to a standard let's create a nonprofit association which we can be members of and you know at the time like central banks weren't really in like the let's just call it like retail electronic money there was that was the birth of retail electronic money and that was really important the central banks didn't say well we have to run all the infrastructure for retail electronic money they said, okay, if you can come up with a self-regulatory scheme and a set of technical standards and everyone agrees to those, and we as central banks say, okay, that looks like it's safe and sound and the issuing institutions that sit underneath it are following our safety and soundness requirements, then that electronic money system is legitimate and we're going to let it run. SWIFT is sort of the same thing as well. It's a nonprofit association. It's a mm -hmm. technical set of standards. These, these associations and standards are actually how the electronic financial system works today. And so what we're basically saying is we need the same kind of consortium models that have public private partnerships that work where governments, including central banks, work with private sector actors to come up with the supervisory frameworks for how this should work. And there shouldn't be 50 different private companies issuing 50 different U.S. dollar stable coins. There should be a U.S. dollar coin and it should be a standard and it should ultimately have um, a rule set that is, is reasonable within the context of of the way the monetary system works. The thing from our perspective though is, um, you, know, the, the, you know, each of these things pushes the experience, the possibilities of money forward in new ways. Like um, the retail electronic money pushed the possibilities of commerce forward in, in really powerful ways. I think mm -hmm. in the case of stable coins, it's much more transformative. It's much, much deeper because you're talking about a digital, you know, digitization of fiat basically means that your your central bank money no matter what currency it is no matter what central bank it is exists everywhere that the internet exists there you go folks now that's uh from jeremy lair now remember jeremy lair is the ceo of circle he's the guy that's bit that's on the advisory board at the imf uh with chris larson He's also the guy I showed you video this past week. He's on stage with Christine Lagarde, and they were talking about a digital SDR. And he's talking about how it happens in this 12 months, the one we're in right now, folks. Um, <laughs> that's what they were talking about. Okay, moving along now. Uh, who's another? Who's another uh, company that's going to be in this digital wallet game? That would be Goldman Sachs. Marcus by Goldman. I showed you the other day. Nowhere on their page does it say anything about digital assets. And I believe that's because they've been in stealth mode over there at Goldman Sachs. Because everybody who's in this game that we've been talking about for two years at some point was at Goldman Sachs. Whether it's 
Steve Mnuchin or whoever, you name them. They were at Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is just part of the infrastructure of the, the power structure of the world. Um, just a, if, if I had to name two or three places, just about everybody who is in charge of all of this has been at the Treasury, the SEC or the White House. And they went to Harvard and they went they were at Goldman Sachs at some point. I mean, that's the pattern, folks. Just about everybody. OK, so and finally, I just wanted to mention that don't forget PolySign, that is PolySign, because PolySign is the most secretive custody project that there's been. They said they're going live in 2020 as well. And I believe that they go live as the back end where all these digital assets are stored safely. Remember, this bill that's about to be passed, the bill that's about to be passed is trillions of dollars. And luckily, PolySign is designed to scale to the trillions under management. That's just as an FYI. Now, I told you that I was going to, the last two days, I went through, um, I, I was wanting to find out who the three guys that were at the center of the financial crisis, which I believe all of this is a solution to. The three guys that were at the center were Hank Paulson, who I went over two days ago, Timothy Geithner, who I went over yesterday, and Ben Bernanke. Well, when I got to, to I was going to show you Ben Bernanke today, and I really, it's all the same stuff. He, it's, the, it's Goldman Sachs. He was there. It's um, the Federal Reserve. You know, he was in the administrations of various, all the same organizations. All these people are the same people, the global organizations, the different stuff. Okay. So I thought for those of you that haven't seen it, instead of really trying to go track down all of the places he's been, because it's most of the same places as the others. Um, I thought I would show you a couple of clips from him when he was at Swell, Ripple Swell in 2017, in case some of you haven't seen it. Here's the first one. Show you one other uh, promo video that they did uh, when he was the year that he was there as well. Well, let me let me refresh that so that we can get you. Okay, um, now I wanted to show you, I, the, the, I found a, a lot of times when I'm doing research for videos, I run across things that, um, that I haven't shown in a while, or I see something that I can't remember if you've seen, and I feel like you need to see it, and today is one of those. I'm going to take this video, this is of Chris Larson, I'm going to take this video, this is something I always remembered, I couldn't remember who said it, and it's important. Because, listen, and I'll tell you right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I believe that the world is about to change. I believe the fin I believe that what we are a part of is, I believe the financial world is about to completely change. And I believe that I have been lucky enough 
to to be a part of bringing this to you for the last almost two years. I don't plan on, I, I do not think I'm going to continue doing this after um, a, another month, few months or so, because I believe we're about to see all this happen. And for that reason, this, this thing that you're about to see, this, what this lady said, it always stuck in my mind. And I believe that she was right. And I believe I, I, I believe that we are a part of something that is about to change everything. And I believe it will be the only time in the history of finance that it has happened or will happen. And not one part of me does not believe this. OK, and for that reason, I'm able to get up every day and do these videos is because there's not one part of me that doesn't believe this. I want you to hear what this lady said. To, to and about Chris Larson on this stage, and this always stuck in my mind. Listen. Prosper, but I did know you when Ripple was open coin, and we were at a dinner in New York a few years ago that was about fintech, a very fascinating group of people around the table, and I remember saying that of all the people there and the amazing and cool things that everybody was doing, that the one who was the most likely to change the world was you, because Ripple has this breathtakingly ambitious view of how we should transform payments and commerce and how we live through interoperability and through new technology rails. So I want to start by just asking you to talk. Anyway, of all the people, he would be the one that would change the world. And I believe that she hit the ball out of the park on that one, because I believe when the history books are written, this is the guy. Uh, well, him, David Schwartz, Brad Garlinghouse, these guys will go down in history. What you're looking at, and I've said it before, what you're looking at is the equivalent of Rockefellers or Vanderbilts or J.P. Morgan, that's what you're looking at when you see this guy on stage, because the history books are going to be written sooner rather than later. And and I'm, I'm just glad that I could have been a part of this history. And and I, I hope and I think that pretty soon I myself will go off into the sunset on this thing, because I think that the time is coming sooner rather than later. I want to show you a couple of other parts of this just so that you can understand um, that that this is bigger than we know. All right, I want to play you a clip from the 5:30 mark. Okay. XRP's ledger. They're all just networks, so that can never be the network of networks. But what they did is they created this thing. We believe the, the winner will be ILP, the Interledger Protocol, which we think is equivalent to IP that changed data and to that shipping container that changed goods. So that's a really profound thing that will play out over the next pick some number, one, two, five, ten years. Uh, that's It's happening right now. Take a moment and talk about the shipping container analogy because I think it's really helpful to people. I did a podcast uh, with Chris. My podcast show is Barefoot Innovation, which is on iTunes if you want to hear it. Uh, and, um, and you talked about the book, The Box, and the fact that the shipping container standardization changed everything about global commerce. Just take a moment to uh, to talk about that metaphor. Sure, uh, you know, again, uh, you shouldn't get excited about shipping containers, but you know, they're very simple things. But that kind of is the point, right? Any kind of global standard or protocol needs to be super simple and basic, super low level, uh, because that's the only way it's going to be adopted by everyone. It's going to be adopted by uh, Europeans, uh, Americans, Chinese, uh, Japanese uh, uh, economy. Um, and a shipping container is super basic. A shipping container is not a shipping company. Um, there is n no way one shipping company, no matter how efficient, will dominate the world. It's going to be hundreds of shipping companies, all with different features for the Nordic countries than uh, what you'd see in Latin America, for example. Shipping container is super basic, um, and why it's so profound is before the shipping container, of course, shipping goods um, was super labor intensive, super inefficient, like moving money is today. You'd send stuff to a port, it had to be unpacked right there at, at the port, repacked. Um, it was a huge drag on global commerce. And then along comes a shipping container, so the goods stay in that container at the point of, of, uh, of manufacturing, sent right to their local port through a truck, a train, then to a ship, back to another ship, another train, another truck, interoperable in any port around the world. 
And when that was created in the 1950s, 700% increase in global trade, completely transformed ports everywhere, created a Cambrian explosion of new sh types of shipping companies. It's exactly what you saw with the internet, by the way, and it's exactly what you're going to see with a very low level. Again, that can't be Bitcoin or Ethereum or the XRP ledger. That will be a part of what happens here. But those things are heavy, they're thick, they're shipping companies with certain features that will never be acceptable to everybody in the world. You need something super low level, uh, something like the interledger protocols, well, again, what we believe in, which is super basic, is not, it's not a ledger, and it's just like it's not a shipping company, um, but something that the Chinese can get behind, uh, you, you can get something in the developing world could get behind, Gates Foundation could get behind, which they have, uh, the Americans could get behind, very basic, very simple. And also very importantly, you know, if you deploy a shipping container in Los Angeles, the port of Los Angeles, it has no effect on the shipping container being used in Amsterdam um, or whatever the port is there. Um, that's not true with databases. One additional entry to the Bitcoin ledger or to HSBC's ledger creates scalability issues to everything else in the system. That, that's why that can't work to be that network of networks. You mentioned the Gates um, okay, so now that shipping container analogy, I wanted you to hear, uh, Chris Larson has used that analogy several times, Brad Garlinghouse has used it several times, but I wanted to show you that that uh, words mean things and it's not a coincidence that I'm, I'm going to show you another guy that used this. Um, he doesn't use shipping container, but he uses railroad car. And I believe that these guys, and he also specifically leaves out the interledger protocol leaves out XRP in, his, in the discussion, and that is Glenn Hutchins. Now, remember, I always like to remind you who Glenn Hutchins is. I think he's one of the most important figures in this. First, he's on the board at the Digital Currency Group, which is one of the first investors in Ripple. Um, one of the advisors on that board is also Larry Summers that you saw in the Harvard video at the beginning of this video. Also, he holds the same position that Timothy Geithner held in the, the 2008 financial crisis, the head of the New York Fed. OK, he's also talking. I mean, they, they may as well. They should have just raised his chair up because he's talking down to the SEC chairman of the United States. That's how powerful this guy is. That's how important of a figure he is. This guy is a big deal. All right. So I want you to to listen to what he says um, in terms of um, the how he describes what's about to happen. And he uses an example very similar to a shipping container, a boxcar. Present the way we've taken out the cost of trading and securities. In the payments world, uh, we use the, the term, the uh, we oftentimes use the term of the payments rails. So there's the credit card rails, there's checking rails, there's the fed wire rails. So let's take, to understand how to, I think to think about the cryptocurrency world, um, is there are three parts of it, the blockchain, the, um, co the, the token, and the protocol. Uh, and the three of them operate together to create one solution, one integrated solution that has the capacity to, to revolutionize the way we move things of value around the world. Let me, let me use a railroad analogy to make the point. Um, the, 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 the token is the equivalent of the boxcar. It's the thing into which you embed something of digital value that needs to be moved from one place to another, from one part of a blockchain to another. The blockchain is the cargo invoice, is the invoice in the cargo manifest. And the rails is the protocol. Uh, and you have to think about all three as one integrated solution that enables you to accomplish the, the purpose of moving anything of value around the world at the speed of light at no cost the way we, we, we uh, talk about email today. People who just talk about blockchain are talking about something very interesting, uh, but it's a piece of enterprise technology that's an advanced database and a private blockchain unconnected to the global, uh, to the, to the uh, Bitcoin or another digital currency blockchain is the equivalent of the intranet. Mm -hmm. Remember when we had intranets to begin with where it was really cool, you could do um, internal communication with people in your own companies, you know, but, but it wasn't really until those intranets were connected via the internet protocol to other intranets to create the world wide web of intranets called the internet that the world changed. The world is gonna change in finance when we connect the private blockchains 
via the Bitcoin or Ethereum or other protocol um, to the other blockchains in the world have a global blockchain that's the World Wide Web of blockchains that'll fundamentally change the way in which not only do we move value around the world at the speed of light, but also in which we actually fundamentally change the way in which we compute because it's the fourth computing paradigm I've experienced in my lifetime, the decentralized computing paradigm. That is the vision of where we can really go with this that's transformational. Now, the first step will be the intranets, mm -hmm. the blockchains, as those get deployed. But that's not the end point. That's just the first step. So there you go. Um, I don't think that um, the boxcar analogy is far enough away from that shipping container to have for these guys to have not had their conversations before. <laughs> um, finally, I want to give a uh, shout out to um, the official. He's the official older brother of the Digital Asset Investor Channel. He, he told his brother, who is the official smart aleck of the Digital Asset Investor Channel, that my show was his Kiplinger letter. And for those of you that don't know, the Kiplinger letter is like a, a financial newsletter that, that has gone out. My dad, I think my dad used to even have a subscription. So, um, he compared my, this is, I'm his Kiplinger letter. He just has to watch commercials here. <laughs> so I wanted to give a shout out to him. And I'm going to finish this by letting you know that you all, that there's still, well, actually, now that I'm looking at it, no, there is that sale still. Hold on a second. It's up here. Um, they are still having the sale at Ledger. You can go in the description of all my videos. There's a chance you can get a chance to win, tw get 20 or 25 percent off, 20 to 25 percent off on the digital, on uh, Ledger Nano S's. Go in the description of all my videos and you'll find the link. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family that I am worn out and I, I am going to see this thing through, but I believe we are on the precipice, folks. And I'm hoping that soon will be the day that I can go into the sunset and know that I fought the good fight and made as many people as I could aware, uh, as I could aware of how the financial world, world is about to completely change. Thank you for listening.